this is uh, session number five. And uh, the truth is, I don't know how many sessions it will be in the end because I decided to just keep it on going until, you know, certainly through, through, through Hanukkah, Zerah Hashem, it's now the second day of Key Slave here in Eris Israel, still the first day of Rosh Chodesh, still in uh, Chutzlarts. And as we mentioned before, previous sessions, that the Zohar says that Baruch Shem Kavod Machu So. The Alambe, which has 24 letters, corresponds to the 24 days of Kislev from Rosh Chodesh until the 24th day of Kislev, and when the battle was fought. And then the Shema corresponds to the 25th day of Kislev itself, which is what it's all about, the 25th, the 25th. Uh, so this is a build-up period. We are, we're now in that period of time right, that we're, we're building towards whatever Hanukkah has to offer, whatever Hanukkah is coming to give to us. Uh, take you know to take full advantage of it, and we began discussing what, last week what was called the equation of life. I sent out the chart uh, of that equation last uh, last week after the last session, and um, I hope you have some time to look at it. I'm just going to go over the the basic components, the basic ideas to you know just as an overview, and then we'll discuss some of these ideas more in depth because it is such a central, such an important idea that if you if someone's interested in understanding what life is about in this universe and what you know how to use your potential what we're here to accomplish and what goes right and what goes wrong so that's the equation of life it's like everything is built inside of it. it's what i would call the the you know the equation of everything because it really sums up everything and if you understand it and you know how to apply it then it's a whole different world and uh, the dreidel actually has it all built into it. And we'll see, you know, why this, you know, shortly Bizarro Shem and other kinds of so many things coming from so many different directions at one time. There's so much material that actually I get overwhelmed when I begin to talk about it because I, I'm always afraid to leave things out or leave out connections. And after it's over, I oh, forgot to mention that thing, forgot to tie it back to that. You know, people are hanging in the air, but uh, I just keep going and hopefully we'll cover the most important points and at least give it a good, a good understanding of what it is that Hanukkah represents, comes to allow us to achieve and what we're supposed to get out of life. So the equation of life, very simple, 25 plus 11 equals 36. It's mathematically true. Nothing wrong with that one, right? 25 subtract 11 equals 14. Also mathematically true. So you get from both sides. You have the 25 in the middle, subtract the 11, and you get uh, 14, and you add the 11, you get 36. What's the difference between 14 and 36? So fundamentally, basically, it's the difference between you know fulfilling the purpose of creation and destroying it, destroying creation. If you look in Parshas Miketz, Parshas Miketz is when when Yosef goes, he's already in Egypt, he gets appointed viceroy of Egypt, he's already uh, interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, and therefore earned the right to become second in command, and the brothers have to now go down to Mitzrayim looking for food because there's a famine, and that's important, detail the entire story, uh, and and then they go down, and uh, you know, but Yosef has concealed his identity. He's kept Shimon. They came down once and he went back again, but this time he kept Shimon because he accused the brothers of being spies, and they had to prove that they're not spies so to, to bring back Binyamin. You know the story; it's in the Chumash. You can read it for yourself. I don't need to go through the whole thing, the whole the whole parsha right now. And you know, in there, you know, Yaakov is like in the middle of the entire thing. And you know, finally, you know, you know, he's forced to agree to allow Binyamin to go down with the 10 brothers, or at least the nine brothers, because one's still in Egypt, to the viceroy. Now, the truth is, Yaakov basically suspects it's Yosef at this point. And there's just too many hints to, to Yosef. In fact, the word maraglim, which means spies, he says maraglim with them, you're spies. Also, an allusion to the spies in Moshe's time, because there's a very strong connection between what happens with Yosef and his brothers here and the spies in Moshe's time as well. And the word Meraglim, actually, each of the letters of the word stand for their own words, what we call a Roshi Tevas, as an, like an acronym of other words. And Meraglim stands for Mi'imi Rachel Genavtem, Midyanim Yishmalim Mechartem, which basically means, from my mother Rachel, you, you stole me. 
and to the Midian, the Midianites, and then they sold it to the Yishmaelim, you sold me. So he's like giving code to his brothers. Like he's like having fun at their expense. What's he doing? He's trying to indicate who he is because it's all part of the Hanukkah story. You know, if you look at you know the the, the, the parsha itself, and the brothers do come back the second time, and they're standing there before Yosef with Benjamin. So there's all kinds of allusions of the, to Hanukkah itself. In fact, right where he says, you know, he tells Menashe, who they don't know it's Menashe, the son of Yosef. They just think he's an Egyptian helper, and he tells Menashe to go sacrifice, or not sacrifice, sorry, go shecht an animal to serve the brothers because they're they're kosher, the kosher, right? Only you know. You know, the highest quality of kashrus at that point in time. So therefore, they have to they have to see the shechit itself. So he tells Menashe to shecht it in front of them so they can see it's all been done properly and remove the get, get a nasha. And the Hebrew words themselves actually are the five letters Chanukah. And in the words that means the shecht the animal, the gematria tavochva tavochva hachein, right? You know, the, the two words is actually 44. And according to the Bnei Yisachar, a wonderful commentary on the Chagim and Chumash, that that 44 is an allusion to the 36 candles of Hanukkah and the eight Shamashim that we light as well. Right there in the story about Yosef and his brothers, all tied together, it's all connected. And, you know, they go down there. And before they go down, and Yaakov finally has to acquiesce and say, okay, fine, so take Binyamin now and go get the food because we're going to start to death otherwise. And he says to the brothers, you know, you know but here's how to do it. Here's how you have to do it. And he tells them, bring a gift and all that. And he men- mentions that, the, you know, the, the God Shekai, right, Shin Dalad Yud, that he should say enough to all our suffering and everything should finally turn around and have a happy ending. That's what he says. He uses the name Shekai. Shin Dalad Yud, it's on your mezuzah. That's what we put the name there as well. That means a specific type of a you know thing. It's a certain type of name, and that's the name that Yaakov chooses. There's there's Havaya Yud Kevavke. There's Alukim, but he chooses this name specifically. Why? So this name has the word die inside of it, like die dayenu, right? Enough. The God who said enough. That's what Rashi brings down. The God who said enough should say enough to my suffering and turn this thing around. That's what Yaakov says now. Enough to what? What did God say enough to? So enough to creation. God's making creation, and he's using the spectacular light he made on the very first day, and he's saying this has to be created, and this has to be created, and this has to happen. This has to happen. Die! Enough! Stop here! No more. The light cannot go down to the bottom. If the light goes all the way to the bottom of creation, then everything gets rectified, everything gets fixed up, there's nothing left for man to do. It's it's Gan Eden plus. It's it's like you know it's, it's even better than Gan Eden because in Gan Eden there was still room for free will, but there's no free will. So God says, "Stop here, leave a void of divine light in creation, so that man can bring the light down the distance." Now, how how far did the light go down? Where did God say stop? So Kabbalah explains that die is not only a word; it's also gematria, Dalad yud. Four plus 10, 14. The light stopped 14 something from the bottom. 14 what? 14 levels. Well, how many levels are there altogether? Well, there's 10 spherot, but the 10 spheres divided into what's called five parts of or five different worlds. It's all cabal. We can have a sheer in this you know, alone just to talk about the, the levels in the world. But just take it for granted, there's five right now. Each of the five have 10 levels. So five times, times 10 is 50. So there's 50 levels from the top of creation. And when I say the top of creation, I don't mean the top of our universe. The universe is a very, very small part of creation. Creation includes the physical world we can see and, and we relate to and look through, look at it through a telescope all the way to the edge of the universe. And it also includes these spiritual worlds that go way beyond the physical world, way up there to the top of everything. It was called the halal, which we spoke about in previous sessions as well. You can look it up online. But it's 50 levels altogether. So the light stops 14 levels in the bottom, which means what? Well, 50 subtract 14 is 36. So when the light came down 36 levels, God stopped it. At that point in time, it said die. That's what the shakai means. It alludes to this die, the 14. 
which means there are 14 levels in creation from the beginning. We already saw last week that there were 11 lights that were rectified. And those unrectified 11 lights basically result in these 14 different levels where darkness prevails and evil. That's, the, that's, the, that's where evil gets to hang out in creation. In the beginning, before the sin, before the chet. Because Adam was above that before the sin in the Garden of Eden. And then he made the mistake of a few things, but, but principally eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and as a result of that, he transformed himself, made himself more physical, and he transformed creation and made it more physical. And all the words, the worlds that were created originally on a higher level descended because of him, which is why the Garden of Eden disappeared, because it can't exist down here. As much as we like to believe it can and try to imitate it, it doesn't happen. Not down here. It's too spiritual. So therefore, the worlds became more physical, and these worlds that we're living in today fell into the world of those 14 levels, where darkness and evil basically exists. And that's why there's just so much evil in creation. That's why there's so much darkness in creation, because of that. It didn't exist prior to the Chet, but after the Chet, that's what happened. Those 14 levels. That's the 14. So the light, which we said is represented by the number 25, but only in its hidden stage. Now, still God has hidden it within creation, within Torah, within the soul, whatever, wherever, wherever he's hidden it. But the hiddenness means that some people can access it and some people can't. And as the lesson points out, it depends upon your traits. But one specific thing we have to still, still discuss in more detail, we talked about it towards the end, this idea of das, Right, the number 11 represents the number of dust. So basically, what we're saying, if you take what's called dust, and we'll talk about that with Rashem now, you take dust represented by the number 11 and you apply that to life, you will access the light of 25, but you'll become a vehicle to reveal it on the outside, and that's represented by the number 36. So 25, meaning the, the creation that we live within with this hidden light, this fantastic hidden light, take dust, apply it to life, you reveal the light, and that's the 36. And that's the 36 candles of Hanukkah. That's what the 36 Tzadikim righteous people do in every generation. That's what the Talmud tries to allow us to do through his 36 tractates, and that's what Shabbos is all about. The 26, the, the, 26, the, the, 20, the, the 36 hours of Shabbos. The 12 hours of Erev Shabbos, because even though it's not Shabbos yet, but some of the Kedusha of Shabbos begins to, to already happen from the morning onward. We build towards Shabbos, and of course, in this, the 24 hours of Shabbos. So that's the, the, the first side of the equation. Now, if you subtract 11 from the 25, then you get the 14. Not only do you not reveal the light, not only do you not bring it onto creation and fix things, like Adam was supposed to do, but instead you reverse it. Adam reversed creation. Clearly, take a look at the world. It's no longer the Garden of Eden, not paradise. Where did paradise go? Well, it was once there, but many of the things that God had fixed up to create paradise disappeared. The moment Adam did his chet because he caused things that were, were rectified to become broken again. It's like someone takes a, you know, a building, they take all the different pieces and they put it together and they make a building out of it. The building's standing once again. And some guy comes along with a sledgehammer, goes boom, and knocks all, all back down again. Where's the building? It's no longer there anymore. So that's what the equation of life is basically telling you. If you, uh, if you apply negative dust, then you get 14. You're going back to the, 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 the re reality we call the klipas, the negative spiritual reality that's responsible for the world we're living in today, where, where, where sheker, falsehood is so rampant, immorality is like accepted way of life because people live in the dark, because we're living in the world of the klipas. They think it's them. They think it's their own personality because it's, they hear the voice in their head, do this, do that. This is permissible. But really, it's because we're living in a, in a realm, an, an era, you know, where where darkness is, is very prevalent, and people think they know a lot more than they do. They think they understand life, and in fact, they're being mis misguided. They're being misled because of this darkness. And and you go from the other side. You add the positive dust. Now, what's interesting, right? And we can't forget this point. It's very, it's crucial. If you go back to the very first sin, what what was the very first mitzvah? 
that, that Adam had. So God says, do not eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil. Now, what's God doing? If God's only testing Adam's loyalty, he just wants to, can you, can you just do what you're told? You know, if I give you instructions, can you just like do them the way you're asked to do it? Or is that too much to ask? So you just need a tree if that's what you want to use. This is the forbidden tree. It's the tree of forbiddenness. Forget the dust part. You don't need the dust part. It's not, you, know, it's not, you don't have to be tested in that. It is two aspects. There's the tree itself and the fact that the dust. But what's interesting is because not only is it a tree of dust, it's a tree of, of dust tovara. It's a dust tovara. A tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, there's the dust. That's 11. And good, positive dust. And, and bad negative dust. And we already saw that Asav comes, he's, there's 11 chieftains of Asav, and they come from these 11 klipos, these 11 spiritual realities that are negative and impure because of these 11 lights that were not rectified. That's the reality of Asav. So right here in this week's Parsha, this Parsha's told us the birth of, of Yaakov and Asav, and really the manifestation of, of Das Tov and Das Ra. The Das of Yaakov Avinu is Das Tov. It's the true Das. It's a Das that transforms the 25 into 36, which is why he marries a wife whose gematria lay is 36, and whose, and, and whose wives, you know, Rachel dies at the age of 36 as he comes back into Israel, because marrying two sisters is one of the 36 prohibitions that Torah says is punishable by chorus excitation. And, and everywhere he goes, he's away from home altogether for 36 years. And when he's injured and he walks away, the sun shines for him. In Parshat V'yishlach, it says, the sun shone for him and that healed him. And the word lo, meaning him, has the gematria 36. And the Maharil says what, what, what healed him, the 36 candles of Hanukkah, etc., etc. Lots and lots of 36s to do with Yaakov and Yosef. It's like weaving into the entire story. Because these people had positive dust, and that's what, that was Adam's choice, to have the positive dust and transform the 25 into 36, which he didn't do. So therefore, God says, Ayeka, where are you? But Ayeka is a gematria, which is 20, Ayeka, where's the 25? You're supposed to reveal and the gematria of the word itself is 36 because that's what's supposed to result. But it, instead of the 36 reality, you have created the 14 reality. A world of darkness, a world of disconnect, spiritual disconnect, a cognitive distance of people incapable of being able to relate to truth and to live by truth. That's the equation of life. So the whole thing, the whole thing comes down to a very simple concept. But as simple as it, as it may be to understand, not so easy for a person to be able to implement unless you follow the path. So what's the positive dust? We see Yaakov is Yoshev Olim, right? He's learning the tense, the Ohel, right? All of Hey Lamed, right? Matthew 36, because he's learning Torah. That's, that's Das Tov. And that's why he's transforming the light of creation and revealing it. And, and Asav, who comes from the side of the negative 11, because he comes from the, the negative 11 klipos, the, the, the negative, the lights that were not rectified, that's negative dust. And everywhere he goes, he's transforming the world into darkness. Interesting. More than interesting. So we need to understand a little bit better this concept of dust, because it's, it's instrumental to this entire equation. You know, a person, a person gets picked up at the coattail or meets somebody in this, somehow they get exposed, you know, there's a famous, um, famous rabbi today, he's a famous rabbi, but he used to be a famous um, talk show host and movie star. He was like a hero, you know, in, in, er in Eretz Israel amongst the secular people. His name was Uri Zohar. He's written books now. Now he's a, <laughs> he looks, like just the opposite of what he once was. You look at the early pictures of him, like literally night and day, literally. 
He was he was atheistic. He was an atheist in the beginning. He was certainly agnostic. He didn't believe, and he certainly made fun of it. You know. So what happened? He happened to have one friend who was was religious, who had a son, and they made a bris. And as a friend, he came to the bris. That's all. <laughs> he just came to the bris, and at the bris, he got into discussion with somebody. And they you know discussed back and forth, and they argued their points. And over time, you know, he began to get swayed because he ran out of arguments and he read whatever he thought he was wrong. Whatever he, you know, had considered was incorrect. He was finding out the truth. How many stories you hear like this of people who were raised reform or conservative and they were taught Judaism and they walked away because they thought this is totally irrelevant because they thought that's the whole thing. That's what Judaism actually is. And, and then much later on in life, they meet someone and they go to a class, they go to a shir, and now you just go online, right? And and boom, it's like, wow. It's like, I had no idea. This is what Torah is. This is what Judaism says. You know, and they start to change their way of thinking. And then one day they become, they become observant, religious. Why? Because a dust, that's all. What happened? Just, just a change of dust. Their mind changed, you know, but but the ideas changed their mind. We're not talking brainwashing. We're not talking even manipulation. That does take place someplace. You know, that does happen in some religions and parts of the world, you know, governments. But but that's not the way it works in Judaism. And you know why? For a very simple reason. Because it says that God's not interested in robots. He's not interested in people who were brainwashed and manipulated to become religious. Although... Many have suggested that might be a, way, a great way to start because you can't talk to some people. But it's, it's just not the way God wants it. God wants your heart. He wants you to intellectually decide that you have come to the truth and he is it. And you now want to connect to him of your own volition, your own free will. Otherwise, it doesn't count for too much. As, as the Gemara says, you, know, you become just like a walking library. There's no life to you, a golem. Yeah, you can go through the motions, and, and that's what happens to a lot of people. When people do mitzvahs as if it's just something that you just have to do, that's what God expects from me, and I'm unobligated. The same way, for example, I have to pay taxes. Do I want to pay taxes? I don't want to pay taxes. Who wants to pay taxes? Even though the taxes help pay for all the things that beautify my community and make the world a better place, but nonetheless, let someone else, I, I want to keep my money and go to restaurants instead or buy something more meaningful, bigger house perhaps, you know, but pay taxes? No. But I do it. You know why? I have to. It's an obligation. Am I happy about it? No. Do I want to sit down with my accountant? No. But I have to do it. So I do it because that's my obligation. But that's not the way Torah works. You don't perform Torah that way. You don't go to Davin Mincha because you have to Davin Mincha. You go, you have to Davin Mincha 100%. It's an obligation. And sometimes you fall back on that. But you're supposed to go to Mincha because you want to connect to God. Because you want to have an aliyah. You want to rise up in levels. When you bench to God, when you after you've eaten and you say Birchat de Mazon, you 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 know the grace after meals, it's not because you know you're just saying thank you. It's because you're trying to say, I really understand and appreciate that I could be foodless. Or I could have burnt the food and it would taste terrible. And here I am enjoying this and giving myself nutrition so I can go do more mitzvahs and earn more reward than the world to come, which is my tremendous merit. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate that. It's a whole different reality, but it comes down to this concept of positive dust versus negative dust. It's, it's amazing in Eretz Israel, for example, how many Israelis were raised and because they were taught that Tanakh was never real. It was written by a bunch of you know old rabbis, perhaps a long time ago, and it doesn't have any basis in reality. And they're shocked to find out just the opposite when they're finally shown what the Torah actually has to say, how we know it came from God at Mount Sinai. And this is the story of every Baal Tshuva. What, what's going on? What's happening? It's, it's very simple. They come in, they sit down, they hear ideas. Discussions take place. And in the course of those discussions, they, you know, concepts go in. And the concepts like mean something. And, and that heart of stone begins to melt, to become a heart of flesh, and, and the life changes because of that. So, this go right to this idea. That's the equation of life, now this is the idea of dust. So, there are as many opinions 
in life as there are people, pretty much. I don't know if exactly that's true, but there are a lot, a lot of opinions in life. The amazing thing is how there can be so many opinions about the same thing. People can have the exact same information and yet two very different takes of what it means. There may be only one objective reality, but there are countless subjective ones. Is it any wonder that world peace is so hard to achieve? It's objective reality. Does it even exist? Well, we hold that it does. This is what the Torah is. This is God's reality. The Torah is God saying, let me tell you the truth about truth, the ultimate truth. It's the objective reality. The same way if a teacher is grading a test, you know, they have a, the answers written down. They compare the answer given to the answer that, that, was, that, that the test requires. If it's accurate, it's the same thing. If it's not, it has to be changed. It's, it's a mistake. So subjective reality is what I personally do with God's objective reality. So, for example, there's a mitzvah to wear to fill it. There's a mitzvah to keep Shabbos, to light Shabbos candles. So some woman lights Shabbos candles by standing there and concentrating and meditating and saying, you hear it, son, and, and, and tries to feel within her bones what she's achieving by lighting these Shabbos candles. And other people just light the match, make the brook, and they move on. Same thing by benching. Uh, it's, this, is, this is a whole different outlook and different approach to life. So what makes one person do that versus that? You often, often hear stories, I mean, countless stories of people who thought they had 60 years left to live and are told now they have six months to live or one year to live maybe. And all of a sudden everything changes. You know, their whole program changes. Why? That information changed everything. They create a whole different perspective. Well, I understand. If the truth is the truth, it shouldn't make a difference how long you have to live. Mm, but there's this thing, you know, where you can put it off and you can, you know, fool yourself you know, and think you have time to rectify it down the road. It's such a, a lot of people on their deathbed do a lot of tshuva, a lot of changes. Even people who are atheists or atheists entire life or agnostic and got away with it. All of a sudden, facing the possibility, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? And it turns out that there is another world coming after this one, and I blew it. A lot of people have asked to speak to rabbis in their final hours, people who never went to shul their entire life, just to find out, or priests in the you know, Christian religion. You know, because the information changes us, changes the way we think, changes our opinions. In short, a person's approach to life is determined by their perspective of it. Personal vision is usually at the exclusion of the vision of others, and we tend to gravitate towards those that are similar to our own and reject those which are different. And I once sat down when I, when I first was becoming observant, um, and I don't just mean looking at the world better, I mean becoming more involved in, in through the, at this point I was already, already committed completely, I don't, not committed to an asylum, but committed to Judaism, and became a Torah observant Jew. And um, a friend of mine, I lost all my friends along the way because when they heard what I was getting involved with, they figured I'd lost it completely, except for one person. One person who had been a cl very close friend of mine all through the years. And uh, he decided that in spite of the fact that we're now very different, our friendship should be able to continue. And I agreed. And he came to visit me at one of my, one of my vacations back to Toronto during the summertime. It's before I was married, still single. And we sat down in, my, in our living room, my living room, and uh, my parents' house, and we were talking, and he asked me, you know, why I did it, and I explained the whole thing, the whole process, and he was fine, and he, then he came back with a statement, he said, well, you know, I believe in to each his own, and therefore, if this is what you want to do, great, you know, fantastic, and I applaud you, but this is what I want to do, and, and you have to also accept that as well, doesn't, you know, what you did doesn't, doesn't apply to me. And I'm sitting there going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, do I say something? Do I, do I tell him? You know, tell him the truth. Probably that's going to be the last time we speak. And uh, but on the other hand, if I don't say something, he's going to walk away thinking that he's right. And uh, you know, back and forth. And finally, I said to him, "Well, it's not exactly like that. It's 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 more like what I'm doing is what every Jew should be doing. And if you want to know more about it and why that's the case, I'll be very happy to tell you." And show you, show you around. 
to see what I what I've seen in the meantime, the last couple of years. That was it. No more. The moment I said that, he became fidgety, uncomfortable, as if like he knew that it was true what I was saying. It wasn't it wasn't he even arguing? He just like you know he he knew. And he said, "Well," you know, and he went back to his opinion again. And we didn't spend much more time after that. Then I never saw him again because because he just didn't want to hear it. His, his diet just re rejected it, you know, it bounced off him because he didn't have the wherewithal to be able to accept it. Now, the interesting thing is, it's, it's, there's many people over the years who that's happened to, who later on I saw and they got more involved and they became, you know, either observant or, or partially observant over time because somehow it triggered something. At that moment, they were not prepared to, you know, jump in two feet, you know, at the same time, but it's it triggered something. And, and uh, you know, I've got inside. There's a famous story of a guy who came to Ishatora before I was there, and uh, he was, um, you know, traveling around, and they got picked up at the hotel, and they brought him in to, the, to, to talk to somebody, who was there specifically to talk to him and people like him. And this person began to give him every discussion and argument that it could possibly, could possibly give him in the course of an hour. And after the hour was over, this guy got up. He didn't, didn't speak the entire time. Didn't say a word the entire time. Just sat there, listened. At the end of the hour, he got up and he said, Rabbi, everything you said makes sense, but I'm leaving anyhow. And he did. He walked out. And I don't know what happened to this, this person, but there's another story where a guy was biking through Europe, got there to Israel, picked up at the wall, brought in, talked to somebody, also didn't say very much at all, like didn't argue, nothing. And when the hour was over, he didn't say everything you said makes sense, but I'm leaving anyhow. He just said, you know, thanks and left. That's it. Gone. And then, you know, a couple of years passed, and the person who spoke to him went back to America to fix to finish off his degree. Went to Florida, you know, went, you know college down there, and spoke to the registrar and said, "You know, I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an observant Jew. Perhaps there's somebody else here who also, you know, keeps Shabbat and things like that that we could be roommates so that it'd be it'd be comfortable to be together in the same room as opposed to someone else that doesn't keep Shabbos." So they said, actually, there is somebody else here who asked for the same thing, and we put you together already because he requested it, and you're in room whatever, you know. So he went upstairs to meet this person, very excited to find out there was somebody else there who was Shammah Shabbos, and uh, he opens the, you know, the door, and as he walks in, the person lying in the bed looks at him, you know, just resting in his bed, you know, looking up. He sees him walk in, and he says hello, and then he says, hey, I know you. He says, you, from, from what? How? Where? Where we met? He says, you don't recognize me? Not at all. He, oh, you know why? Because the last time you saw me, I had long hair down to my shoulders, right? I was wearing a leather jacket. I was biking through Europe, and you spoke to me for about an hour, and I just picked up and left after that. He said, you're him? What happened? He said, there was something you said that I couldn't get out of my mind, even though I went back to Europe and I'm still on my motorcycle and I'm biking around the whole thing, this thing just went over and over and over again in my head and I had no answer for it. I don't know what it was, but it was something. And when he got back to America, it, it still bothered him. So he called up a rabbi, actually a reform rabbi, and was not satisfied with the answer. So he called up a conservative rabbi. I'm not making this up. This is the way I heard the story called up a conservative rabbi, and again, it, it just didn't work. The, the answer wasn't, wasn't good. So he called up a, a Chabad rabbi, and he said, this is how we understand this. He, was, he liked the answer. The rabbi, of course, invited him for Shabbos. He didn't want to go. He went anyhow. And one Shabbos led to another Shabbos, another Shabbos, another Shabbos. Eventually, the hair got cut. Jacket was gone. The bike, too. And the person became a, a Shomer Shabbos Jew. How does that happen? Well, that's 25 plus 11 equals 36. That's what that is. The other guy was 25 subtract 11 equals 14. He's walking away in darkness, living a life that's basically sheker. It's falsehood because it's not the way we were created to live. And it comes down to this concept of dust. So what makes one person's dust different then another person's dust. So it says, perceptions, says because I wrote it. Perceptions, however, 
are built upon assumptions. That is a crucial point that most people don't understand and they certainly take for granted. Perception of reality, which guides our lives, which tells us what to do, which, which influences our decisions, that's our perceptions. But the perceptions, they're built upon assumptions. Now, an assumption is a different thing. Assumption is an assumption. <laughs> what does it mean? You're assuming something. But there are levels of assumption. Even when it comes to Torah, we're making assumptions too. But the difference is, is that there are assumptions you can make because it's got to be true. And there are assumptions you make because that's just what people have been doing the entire time. I mean, where did Western society come from? How did it become what it is today? How, what's the basis of all the laws? What's the history of it all? And how much has just like been added on because that's what reality at the time demanded? Does it all make sense? Where's it coming? What's the source? What's the origin of all that? How many people even ask that question? Just take it for granted. So it's like it's like you have to cross a canyon. You see, because even Judaism, right, has to leave room for doubt. Has to. Because where's there room for Amuna and Bitachon? How can you possibly trust in God if you know 100% for sure he's going to come through? You don't need trust. If you really believe and you know that he's going to come through every single time, it's because you're not sure you're going to get what you want or need at this time that you have to have Bitachon and have a moon of faith in God. But the question is, you have to jump across the canyon. Everyone's jumping across a canyon. But where do you want to jump from? From a gap this big or from a gap this big? Right? We, we do this in business all the time. When it comes to money, forget it. You know, some people like to take risks. It's fun. Maybe they have the money to do it. They can afford to lose you know, a lot of money or just some money. But the average person who invests money wants to make money. So he tries to limit his risks. He, I'm going to have to jump no matter what. I don't, I'm not a fortune teller, certainly not a prophet. I want to make profits, but I'm not a prophet myself. And therefore, I don't know what's going to happen next in the economy. Go up, go down. We have analysts. We have experts to try to you know, analyze the trends so we can make a, a leap of faith. But hopefully, from a very, very small you know, you know, from a short distance. That's what we do when it comes to money. When it comes to life, people leave the gap very wide and then try to jump over it because it doesn't look like a gap. It doesn't look like the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon, if you're going to jump from one side to the other side, you're going to know if you miss and you're going to know if you're falling. And you'll probably know for a moment or two if you hit the ground. That's an assumption you can make, for sure. When it comes to con concepts, it comes to life, spiritual reality, it, you, you know, you don't even know you're falling sometimes or most of the time. And until a person dies or close to death and they actually show you what life is supposed to be about, and you, oh, that's what life was about. <laughs> oh, gee, I wish I knew that 35, 40, 50, 60 years ago. We've done things differently. So, you know, you have to check out your assumptions. So that's what happens to the Baal Tshuva. The Baal Tshuva comes into Yeshiva, sits across from somebody, and argues. No, nah, it didn't come from Mount Sinai. How can it? We're the people. Yeah, and then you come back with a counter-argument. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's a lot of discussion going on, a lot of reading. right? And, and all of a sudden, the person begins to find out that assumptions that they made about life, they made about Judaism, they made about God, they made it about reality, turns out that they're, they're baseless. They're incorrect. The whole point of Torah, basically, is to present mankind with an objective reality that we can compare our assumptions to. I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I walk around with these assumptions. Some I got just after I got born, when I was growing up, and I got a lot from my parents, and I got a lot from my school, and my teachers, and my friends, and a lot from the media, right? And I, and I just put them in. They just, you know, filed themselves inside of me somehow. Then as I did, my perceptions were affected and changed. And, and unless someone challenges those perceptions and those assumptions, then there's no reason to think that they're wrong. And that's why a person and so many billions of people for thousands of years, billions of people have lived far less 
meaningful lives than they could have because of faulty assumptions. And the truth is, the painful truth is, it's really our fault. Because the prophet Yeshaya says that we were given Torah. Yes, Torah in, you know, in all its specifics is really for the Jewish people. But we're supposed to be an Orla Goyim. We're supposed to be the light unto the nations. We're supposed to tell, you know, be an example of what, what counts most in life. So that they can, they, can, they can correct their assumptions about life and therefore their perceptions. And that's how you get world peace. World peace comes from everybody having similar assumptions and therefore similar perceptions. As long as the assumptions about life vary, Russia has theirs and you know Uruguay has theirs and Canada has theirs and America has theirs and you know the Democrats have theirs and Republicans have theirs. It's like as long as you know, you're gonna have machlokas, you're gonna have fighting. Because it I'm fighting for my way of life, you're fighting for your way of life. The question comes down to which are the right assumptions. So for 2,000 years, 2,448 years for that matter, the world just didn't get it. Avraham did, Yitzchak did, but, but most of the world didn't get it. So, and, even, and even their descendants didn't get it the same way they did. So therefore God said, here, take this book. I'm, I'm the manufacturer. I, I put the whole thing together. Here is the manufacturer's you know, you know, catalog or instruction booklet to tell you, you know, what life is about. It's to give you the proper assumptions about life so that you will have the proper perceptions about life and therefore know what to do and what not to do. That's what the equation of life is all about in the end. Thus, the top priority in life, if a person wants to truly, wants to live a truly meaningful one, is to make sure to have the correct assumptions about reality. That's, that's top priority. You know, what do I think? What do I believe? What's my belief based upon? You know, even just what's going on, you know, with, with, the, with the mass and the virus and all that, you've got, you know, people on one corner who are arguing, no, the masks are essential and you have to wear them. And it's for sure making a difference. And if you don't, you're damaging other people and yourself for that matter. And in the other corner, you got people saying, no, it's all a narrative. It's a government's narrative and it's, it's a conspiracy and, and, it, and it makes things worse. And, you know, and, and two points of view, but at the end of the day, there's, a, there's an objective truth. What it is exactly, honestly, at this point in time, I'm not even sure. But it exists. If a person were to take the time to research it on their own, to get to the bottom of it, then they would come up with it. But if you don't, then you just left with all these different opinions. Likewise, when it comes to Western society. And even in the Torah world, you have this, a similar situation. There's a lack of peace, a lack of shlemus, of, of unity, in the Torah world too. Because even though we're all in agreement to which are the 613 commandments, there's a little bit of a disagreement between one group and another group as to exactly how to do it the proper way. So you have machlokas, you have arguments in the Gemara, one after the other. This is the tradition. This is the way it should be done. These are the details. And then one argues back, you know, it's a mess. One of the reasons why we need Mashiach. You know, the Gemara says very often when we get to a situation, we can't resolve this machlok because we can't come up with a definitive answer. It uses the word teiku. Teiku is also a Roshi table. It's an acronym. It stands for tishbi yavo. Tishbi yavo. It's a kushis v'bayu. That Eliyahu, the prophet, will have to come and answer the questions and the problems and the answers because we're at a loss to do it ourselves because we lack that clear dust over time, start to disappear somewhat. But that's what we do have. The Torah we do have, it's that dust. And if you want to know whether or not you are living an accurate life, you're doing things the way it needs to be done, not just fitting in, not just living out a life, but the life, you have to compare your assumptions to those of the Torah presents to see how accurate you are. And that's what happens to Baal Tshuva. The Torah acts like a foil, like a mirror. It shows you what's right, and then you can say, well, how do I relate to that? When my Rosh Hashiva of Noach Weinberg, he, he said, you know, he talked about it, learning how to learn properly. He, he told us there's four things you have to do to, to learn something properly, especially when it comes to the Talmud. Number one, what does it say? Simple, the simple explanation. Don't try and fit anything into it. Just understand it for what it's saying. 
Number two, now what the commentators say about that, but only after you've worked it out. Number three, how does your opinion differ from theirs? Because you're using their opinion. They're the ones giving the tradition. And yours is different. You understand it differently. By resolving that difference, and you're able to correct your way of thinking. More Torah-like. And the last thing, what does this idea teach you about life? Because that's, it has to come home to that at the end. Every concept, every idea, no matter how abstract, by definition, comes to give us musr, comes to give us you know, lessons about life. So the Torah tells us from the start that there's das tov, good das, and there's das ra, bad das. History has certainly confirmed this. We see that. The trick in life, of course, is to develop good das, which apparently was the role of the other tree in the middle of the garden, the Yitzchayim, the tree of life. As we said before, that it wasn't that Adnan was never supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was that he was supposed to eat from it after the tree of life, or at least at the same time. Because then that would have turned whatever potential bad dust there was into good dust. Without that wisdom, without that knowledge, then you could end up with bad dust. And that's happened to many people. Lots of people have over time been religious ones and then left it. <laughs> Lots of people have left behind you know, Judaism because they got that bad dust. How many people have been damaged by the internet, which is probably the best replication of a tree of knowledge of good and evil in 5,781 years? How many people have gotten bad dust from it? Because it's tons of good dust, for sure. But tons of bad dust too. People exposed to things that otherwise they never would have been exposed to. So Kabbalistically, dust is associated with the number 11. There are 10 general spheres, but the sphere of dust is not one of them and is often referred to as the 11th sphere. When it is accessed in its proper location among the spheres, just below the spheres of Chacham Bina, it is good dust and called tree of life. When it is dragged in and accessed on lower levels, becomes bad dust and becomes Eitzah Dust of Ara. That's a complicated point, obviously very Kabbalistic and probably flew over the heads of most people, flies over my head every single time, right? But the basic idea is, is that, you know, dust is not just something that's hanging in the air and you, you grab at it and it's, it's automatically positive. It's the reality of the, of the dust, this not, reality of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, that when it's in a framework of Torah, when you have this, we call this misgar, it's like a filing cabinet, right? If you, if you have a filing cabinet that's properly ordered, A, B, C, D, the, you know, all of base gimel, right? Then whatever you need, you can, you can put into the this proper location, this proper place, and then you can find it when you re require it. And you can find the connections and make all kinds of connections. The Ramchal, in his introduction to the way of God, Der Hashem, makes his point in the introduction. He says, he says, what's it like? Why have I taken the time to organize all this material and present it in such a way? He says, it's the difference between walking into an organized, beautiful you know, garden, where you got the roses over here, the tulips over here, everything's like really masudar, it's all organized. Versus have the exact same flowers, but they're all mixed together in a mess, with weeds even you know, mixed amongst them. Even though it's the exact same amount of flowers, you cannot appreciate them, you can't use them properly because you're lacking the organization. The Eitzachayim, the tree of life, is that protective coating, so to speak, that allows a person to access the knowledge of creation. I mean, so you have scientists who know phenomenal amounts of information about existence, knowledge that should, should turn them to God without question. And some have, you know, done exactly that. And others, just the opposite. An example, for example, you know, is, is like a person, you know, and this has happened, I've seen this happen in real life, where someone has come into the yeshiva, they've learned a little bit, they got to the point where they say, wow, this is amazing, I realize this is true, this is where it's at, but my parents are demanding I go back to college in the meantime. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm not going to stay. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to college. And in two, three years' time, I'm going to come back. And almost never does that happen. In the course of two to three years, 
They listen to a bunch of professors, a lot of friends. They live in a certain environment. Whatever excitement, whatever connection they had that they got while they were in the shiva, didn't work. Why? Because they did not eat from the Yitzchai in Torah. First, they ate from the Yitzchadas Tovarah, secular knowledge. And that interfered. On the other hand, people who sat and learned for two or three years and then went back to college, not only did it not turn them away from Judaism, but all the knowledge that they collected, doctors who looked at the body, you know, they, they became you know, medical professionals and they looking at all the, you know, the way the body works and the miracles of life, they became more impressed with God's world and what God has done because they had the eight Zechayim first. They had the proper assumptions. The amazing thing is, is how many people I've watched debates, you know, between between Darwinists and and you know religionists, and uh, you see, go on, and and I've been involved in discussions with people like that. And the amazing thing is, is how people argue the point that God does not exist, based upon almost nothing, nothing, because they have not done the research. Amazingly. They have not done the research. They could, they could not stand up before a, 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 an assembly of scientists and make a presentation about what they believe based upon the amount of evidence that they've collected regarding what religion is all about. It's more, it really is almost more that because God doesn't come down and stop me from doing what I'm you know, doing or saying what I'm saying, but the more you learn Torah, it gets to the point where you go way beyond you have this knowledge that's so all-encompassing. And this is what the Or HaGanuz was. Because you have to remember, it was the Jews versus the Greeks. It wasn't just the Jews versus the Romans. The Romans, they didn't have to argue that much. They didn't really care. They were mostly interested in building an empire, of bringing money in to feed that empire. So <laughs> philosophically, you know, as long as you paid your taxes, it's okay. The only reason why the temple was destroyed, aside from the divine province involved in that, was because the people wanted to fight back. But if the Jews, as instructed by the leading Torah rabbis at that time, had simply paid their taxes, we would have kept the temple, kept our country, because it was the money the Romans wanted, but not the Greeks. It was ideology. The Hellenists, Aristotle, Socrates, it was, you know, it was, it was a, a, a way of thinking, a way of life. It was brilliant, but it was also you know, counter Torah. And that's why there was a clash. And then we'll talk a little bit more about Hashem, why that had to be from a divine providence point of view. Because a very important part of all this discussion is understanding how God works in creation. And, and most things seem like a result, but the reality is it's more the reason. God sent the Greeks in to cause problems for the Jews, because something had to come from that. Even in a few parshims from now, and with, you know, Yehuda will tell the brothers, we have to sell Yosef. And after they do, Yaakov cannot be consoled. So the brothers demote ya ya Yehuda. They come to him and say, they say to him, you told us to sell him, and we listened to you. If you had told us not to sell him, we also would have listened to you. But since you didn't, we hold you responsible and you're to blame for demoting you. But the priest that it explains, it's only because the brothers didn't know at that time what it was all about. Later on, Yosef will tell them 22 years later that, nah, you meant to do me harm, but it was all God. God sent me down to Egypt. The Gemara says so. The Medrash says so. To save the Jewish people, to be here, be able to you know, prepare the way for you came down because of the famine. All that, that is all. Because, because God's forcing the issue. So, Yosef at Tzadik, right, being the eleventh son, eleven, right, of the of Yaakov Avinu and the opposer of the eleven clippers of Asaph, because he opened the Chumash, it says right there, the Yaakov stayed by Lavan for how long? Until Yosef was born. Once Yosef was born, as Rashi explains, bringing down the Medrash, Yaakov says, oh, now that the opposer, now that the opposer of Asaph exists, I can now comfortably and securely head back home. Why not Yehuda? 
Why not, you know, Reuben, Shimon, why not the other 10 brothers? Why specifically Yosef? Because he's the 11th son. He's born 11th, not first, not five, fifth, but 11th. Is that just a coincidence? Is that significant? You have Esav, who's represented by this negative, negative 11, and Yosef, who's represented by this positive 11, and he's the opposing, you know, you know figure. That's why it's not such a stretch of the imagination. It might be hard for people to believe and people to accept because we have a, we have a problem applying biblical concepts to modern day events. But it is significant that when the attack took place on September 11th, 2001, that the, that the buildings that they hit were the only ones in the entire skyline in the shape of 11. And they represented the progress of Asaph, twin towers. Like that, that was the, the symbol of a Savian power and a Savian outlook. And it came after, you know, the year you know, 2000, right, which, which was called Y2K, which in Hebrew is Yud Beis Kuf, which is Yabok in Hebrew, which is the river that Yaakov crossed over to become Yisrael, who's built upon this positive 11, and which the Arizal says represents the shleimus, the completion of a person, because the gematria of Yabok, Yud Beis Kuf, 112, is equal to three names of God, Yud Ke Vav Ke, Aleph He Yud He, Akya, and, and Aleph Delad Nun Yud, combined together, but they, could, they correspond to three levels of soul, each of these names. So when a person crosses the Yabok, then they stop being what? Well, Yaakov, let's not forget, was the twin of Asaph, holding on to the heel. He comes and hold. what does that mean? Right? Holding on to the heel. Because quite simply, in the course of 3,320 some odd years of history, if Yaakov doesn't lead, then Yaakov follows. That's assimilation. That's the Jewish people. That was the misyavning. That was the Hellenist. If we're not leading with the Eitz Achayim, then we're following the Eitz Adas Tovara. That's been the ongoing struggle of the Jewish people throughout history, in this long, long history. So it's the equation of life. It's what determines everything. The 25 that's a static reality, meaning that the light's hidden in creation, in whatever, and everything, everything. A candle, you can light it just to see where you're going, or you can light it to welcome in the Shabbos. Is there a difference? Is there a difference if, if you light a candle just in the street, just to see where you're going to make sure it's not too, too dark? Or you light a candle because you're, you're commemorating a miracle and divine providence? Well, according to the halacha, yeah. A big difference, which is the reason why you put it within three to ten amas from the ground if you light outside. In the house is a different story, but ideally, that's where you light it, between three and ten amas from the ground. That's, you know, I thought, sorry, um, tfachim from the ground, very, very low, but, but you know, not even like waist height. That's the ideal height. Because it has to be clear, this light is not for the sake of lighting the streets. This is for the sake of the Ne'er Shul Hanukkah, a whole different reality. Because as a light for the street, the Or HaGenuz doesn't come out. You're not really transfer, you know, trans, you know, you know, forming the light 25 into the light of 36, as Ne'er Shul Hanukkah you do. And where do you light it? Well, halachically, within three tfachi, that's called on the ground itself. You can't put the ground because that's not... That's not, you know, honoring the mitzvah to keep off the ground somewhat, but close to the ground. Why? Because, as we said at the beginning, the light came down 36 levels. 14 levels, it did not come down because that's our job. By drawing down that light of 36 into the world below, right to the bottom of creation, we fix everything. We fix the negative 11. We get rid of the klipa called Asaph. You bring Mashiach. That's what it. That's what it is. That's what the light of Hanukkah. It's the light of Mashiach. 
So what do we do with our menorah? Bring it down towards the ground. If not symbolizing, but actually, actually drawing down the light of 36 to the very bottom of creation, fixing it up, at least in our own personal way, as much as possible. And as many people do it nationally too. But that's that's the equation of life. That's what we're leading towards Hanukkah time. We're not finished yet. That That's just one aspect of it. It's just tying together the different parts of the equation of life. I hope I made it somewhat clear. We'll go on, because there's a whole other part to all of this that we have to put into perspective before we can finally implement this information, fix ourselves, and we fix the world too.